92.3 KPFB in Berkeley and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. Jeff Fawcett and I come to you weekly with a critical independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. This show is the finale of your own health and fitness. It's last episode. It's a farewell. I'm Lena Berman, originator, innovator, host, and producer of this show, your own health and fitness. Today, I want to talk about how I came to do the show and what it meant to me. If, at the end, I'd, I'd like to get Jeffrey in on this show a little bit to talk a little bit together about it, what it's meant to us. Um, people often say to me, you know, I, I want to be a health integrationist. How do I become a health integrationist? And I think of how funny that is because it means that they would have to if gone through what I went through to to be a health integrationist, whatever that is, whatever 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 it meant, it meant uh, to have any, everything integrated, everything everything leading one thing to another. But the point is that that what led me to what I do is 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 the is the life that I led, and. The life that I led as a little girl was uh, pretty lonely. We moved from New York when I was very, so I was about seven or eight years old. And we moved to Mill Valley in California and um, to, to Tam Junction is what it was called then. And what, what, what we didn't know when, when we moved there was that, um, Tam Junction and Mill Valley in that area was not at all developed. Uh, so my father didn't feel that he could start his dental practice there. Uh, this ironic now, considering how built up it is, but there were cows on the hill grazing and stuff. So when, um, when, when we moved from Mill Valley, we moved to San Francisco and he opened a practice close by the house. So he used to, could walk to work, you know, was that sort of thing. But but things happened to me uh, in in the development in the in in and the times that we were moving and whatnot that were affecting that affected my child that affected my life later. Um, I was raised in a house that was was <laughs> was really filled with black mold and. My father's work, being a dentist, meant that he exposed us to mercury every night when he came home. Um, I started to develop a severe allergy to milk, and 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 I was forced to drink it because it was considered the most important food in the world, milk. So if you didn't drink your milk, you couldn't you couldn't survive. And other allergies uh, followed. Um, my mother also stopped breastfeeding me because of colicky reactions, milk reactions, and they never figured out what this was about, that it might be related to this. Um, when I went to live at Tassajara Zen Center's Zen Mountain Center, when I was in my 20s, there was a man who was there who was um, came in a very... He was a friend of uh, Baker Rushi's, and he was very, very ill. And um, they, they sort of felt like it was psychiatric, but anyway. And he um, changed himself while he was there. <laughs> I watched him change himself. He would uh, he went went running on his lunch breaks. He stopped eating starches. He started doing all these things. And uh, I would turn around in the zendo and see him doing this, and wondering how you could do this, how you could change yourself in that way. And um, he told me that he felt like, among other things, that I really needed to exercise. So I started swimming there. And um, it was quite dramatic. But uh, when I came back from Tassajara, and I was living in the city, and I was trying to piece together how to take care of myself, I 
went on a mission to get a career and uh unfortunately i chose a career in um in uh art, commercial art and uh and was exposed at that point to lots of different things um we were using at that point rubber cement thinner um uh, things like that uh to, we were pace, pacing up with rubber cement and um Print shops have lots of toxins in them, and um, I I developed some sensitivities then. I got very confused and I got very mixed up, and um, I wasn't doing my job very well, but I didn't know what was causing the problem. I went on to uh, work independently by myself, you know, freelancing and whatnot, and I kept increasingly getting sensitive to things, and um, the um, the... I encountered a woman who uh, uh, was sensitive herself, and she talked to me about chemical sensitivities and told me to do an experiment of working without using markers and rubber cement thinner and all this stuff. And uh, remarkably, I felt much better. Uh, So I began to get a sense that something was wrong. So I went to a variety of uh, doctors, um, a lot of them alternative treatment doctors, who tested me things, uh, allergy elimination tests, um, people who tested thyroid and found out about uh, I had I had some kind of thyroid disease. Um, that sounds much more dramatic than what it was. It was uh, I had antibodies against my thyroid. It's 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 dramatic enough, and uh, several people in my family do as well. So. This was this was the beginning of, of how I figured out that I was sensitive and um, the rest is history because because really the reason that I did this show, the reason I wanted to do the show was to me um, it's a voice for some other people in the world who are sensitive as well and, and who don't have any idea what's going on with them and who don't have anyone to answer their questions or any of that sort of thing. It was my intention to be the voice that I wanted to hear uh, so guiding me. You know, so it, was, it was very, very hard to do this all by myself. So um, it, 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 uh, it, 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 it's it ever been the case that uh, the more research that I've done into this sort of things that b- both cause sensitivity and and um, not not. And that um, caused people to become sensitive. So I felt like I became an advocate for people who were like me, who felt fall between the cracks, who don't respond well to conventional medical settings and who have, have lots of problems because of it. And there's a certain kind of loneliness that takes place in the midst of all of this. Um, it was a, it was very hard to get people to know what I was going through, and I mostly didn't talk about it, but couldn't be in environments with lots of perfume or couldn't be in environments with lots of, um, you know, um, mostly most most of the things that are around. Like it was very popular during that time to use colognes and perfumes and everything else that around that stuff. Um, but uh, pesticides and things like this. So, so that's what that's what brought me to this point was that it was by unwinding my own problems that I got to a point where I began to feel more confident about talking to other people about them. But I didn't reveal so much uh, about my own situation. But now, now I've been beaten by technology because. I was using technology in the early years of figuring out what to do for a living. As an art director, I was given a computer in, in the 80s and told to figure it out. It was a, it was a um, the DOS-based, the um, Windows-based machines. And it was very hard to figure it out, and I was getting sick while I was trying to figure it out. Anyway, it... it it sort of settled out when I went on to go into freelance and stuff. So freelancing, I was able to control my environment and I was able to work uh, somewhat 
that way. And then I got involved in fitness because I was ever involved in fitness. And I started lifting weights and I started training. And um, one thing led to another and I ended up getting injured. And that led me to figuring out why did I get injured. And I got injured uh, because of the way in which traditional bodybuilding traditional anything um, works for someone like me so I um, so I stopped uh, doing that and went into studying to become a trainer to figure out what it was that was different the training led me to uh, work in that kind of environment um, some somebody who was uh, training other people who were sick how to move safely and it was really uh, led is what led to the show because I was being interviewed on an AM station in Petaluma, a very small station, and they um, the, <laughs> the uh, guy who was managing the station came out and he said, "My goodness, you sound like so so perfect. You're so good. You're so. How long have you been on the radio?" And I said, "This is my first time," and they gave me a drive time slot, and then. Uh, one thing led to another, and I was on KSRO for a year, and um, and then I approached KPFA, and they were looking for uh, they were looking for a health show, or they were looking for a health strip. So that's how I got on the air. Um, the um, the the problem with with the technology has increased. Because the technology has increased, and the exposures from the infrastructure have increased my, my early simple my early symptoms were w- with my eyes you, usually it was um you know hyper arousal heart palpitations hyper arousal you know the kind of nervous kind of thing, but then my eyes started to get worse until I started to have extreme blurry vision dizziness that I could um resolve when I got home but uh, you know how 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 far can it, how far can you move out and not be affected? Um, the the um, my eyes are damaged now and I can't use the equipment to do interviews or record shows. Um, now this happened to me. It isn't clear that it's happening to you, but it is clear that it's happening to some of us to some extent. All, all, all over, because the experience that I had, which is what we, we talked about on the show a lot, a toxin, toxic and induced loss of tolerance, means that you reach a critical point and it spills over. So, with the sensitivities that I had, um, it, it left me open to be sensitive to this too. But anybody can become this sensitive uh, with. Um, with this kind of exposure. So uh, I want you to I want you to think about really critically I'd be suspicious of the motivations of industrial medicine and conventions, corporations that follow the money, consider who the experts are, who's paying them, all that all that we, we learned a lot about uh, about um, PG and E during its uh, tree cutting program when they came over to our property and told us they were going to cut a 30-foot swath uh, from <laughs> right down the middle of our property to cut down everything that was under trees. And um, our power lines are 200 feet above the ground, and they are um, over most, much of it, or, or all of our properties forested, so it's it's really hard to do that. And they were talking about how they're going to do this, and we said we said no, you're not going to do that. Um, we say no to that, and we went through the process of getting. They were getting people to sign contracts and whatnot. It's it, it, this isn't about. I mean, it's <laughs> when when we fought the f- smart meters. It was. It took. It took a uh, fifty and hundred people uh, at these meetings, at every meeting, at ever over, over and over and over and over again, uh, before they even allowed an opt out. But uh, it's all. It's, it's all sort of failed now because 
they're they put in no matter what um, and they do emit uh they emit emit r f even if they're not even if they're not hooked up to an infrastructure even if they're coming out and checking you or uh coming out and um they're sort of estimating your usage not coming out rather than <laughs> not coming out at all they're just estimating your usage. So the reason I'm telling you this is because some of you may wonder what it was um, that happened, and also what what it what it means for the rest of you, and that and that um, anybody can be damaged by these these things over time. So um, something I've learned in the midst of this is that uh, people are extremely different, and what what um what it what it, how they function and how their health works and their balance works and no one has all the answers just some of the puzzle pieces you're listening to the finale of your own health and fitness this is our last show um, i'm talking a bit about uh, who i am and what what led me to li- doing this work <laughs> As te- technology is driving us, the contemporary technology is driving us off a cliff, you might want to think about it by stepping back. I mean, if, if, if everything is going forward and it's going to lead over a cliff, step back. Think about how people did things a couple hundred years ago without plastics, jets, smartphones. How did people, for instance, grow food, move about, communicate how did they foment political change? How did birth and death work? That was sort of the underground, and now this, there's a new green green burial underground. Um, stay, stay dry. How did how did people make clothing that was free of moisture? You know, so you get out in the rain and whatnot. Does it? Did you ever think about that? Is it true that? that they were maybe clothes that were oiled with animal fat or something, curialness. Why don't Africans have heart disease and cancer? That's not what's killing them, not heart disease and cancer. How did they build? You get the picture. Even 20 years ago, see if you can can use some of these ideas, um, bright letters, green burial, communicate with friends, by getting together with them, uh, curialness, I mean, all those things build. How did people do it without all this plastic and all this crap? It's it's very hard to stop the show. It, um, I remember uh, Clara Felix, uh, maybe you don't, maybe you do. If you've been listening to long enough, if the show long enough, we've lost a lot of these dear, dear people along the way. Um and and uh clara when she was about to die she called to say goodbye and i said how do you feel about this how do you feel about dying and she said oh lena i feel free for somebody who has done a newsletter for free given it away and um for years she just did clara clara felix letter just for years and how beleaguered she felt all the time about the responsibility of doing it and doing it well, spending all the time in the um, medical libraries. She said, I feel so responsible for everything. Now I feel free. I guess I feel some of the same thing. But it's hard It's hard to work, walk away from affection and love. At, at my walks at night when I was living in Petaluma, um, I used to walk at night after dinner and then there was this big kitty that it was named Big Kitty. Who was a um, uh, he was a uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the kind of cat. Maine Coon. Oh, he was a Maine Coon. Interrupted my lovely solitude walks, and he was but 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 rather lonely solitude walk, walks. He would follow me, and he would wait. You know, I'd say, "No, Big Kitty, you can't come back with me. You can't come." And he would stop and wait under the street light, and I just couldn't. It was really painful. But um, but when we find love, we also find loss. So 
sometime recently, um, I had an incident with a squirrel because Chance brought him to me and he was barely alive. And I kept him awake. I kept him alive. I put him in a box and, and I've got in a cage, actually a little cage. And I kept him warm and this and that. And, um, he made it through the night and the next day he clearly was giving up and going and it was it was so hard for me because um i i looked at how perfect he was and how how soft he was and how lovely he was and at the end it's very hard to just let let him go because at the end, it can get a little, you know, the breathing gets difficult and stuff. And he started to struggle a little. And I just just kept thinking, well, there must be one last thing I can do to try to save this life. Um, so uh, he didn't. <laughs> and um, and I might say here that it's important to think of when we, when we die, that we nurture the ground, that we always... We walked on and lived on always. Try to be useful. Green burial. Look into it rather than burning, which really cocks up the um, atmosphere. So um, I had a friend who asked me to do a show uh, about aging. And um, yes, I think you can stay active and mobile and still discover things and recognize that things change and embrace change and all of that but many things are lost many things and I wonder if loss can lead to liberation if we can let go when we go not turning away not disassociating but feeling it um, the um The reason I wanted to stop now, even though, you know, I probably still have a few shows left in me, is that I felt that I didn't want to be sort of torn away from the microphone with my cold, dead hands on the microphone. It was like, uh, I, no, I didn't want to go past my my um, my usefulness. And um, I, I probably would have, if it hadn't been for the technology, probably would have continued My wish, my wish for you, is that is that you act like you belong here. That all life should be treated as though you you should treat it as though your life depends on it. You should treat and respect it with with everything you've got because it does. Don't do anything to your fellow travelers, your animals, your birds, reptiles, fish, and sectaries. Did you wouldn't want done to you? Yes, that's actually what it is. It actually, is what it is. It, everything depends on you and what you do, and how you save and uh, as best you can save the uh, the other creatures in the environment with you. Keep your heart opening. Keep it. Sorry. Keep your heart open, even if it's excruciating. But forgive yourself when you fail. After all, you deserve love too. Don't put anyone's head over your own. Find your inner voice or voices, and listen to them. Don't do what they say if they tell you to kill somebody or kill you know yourself. But do listen and give them witness. And do what they say, especially if they say, go dancing. The things we call the natural world are still all around us and within us. Look, stop, listen, smell, take time to use your senses, shut up, mostly, but sometimes speak up. Um, the body... The most important thing that I have learned is that um, nothing happens in a vacuum. There is no vacuums in nature. So when something does happen, uh, it happens for a reason. And 
it's hard to tell what those reasons might be. For instance, um, well, it, it's some examples that are pretty easy to see is that cholesterol goes up when it carries uh, antioxidants uh, throughout the body. So it goes up when there's inflammation and it also goes up when diets are high in sugar and high in starches and stuff. So clots are mostly white cells. They're not cholesterol. And in fact, there's a form of cholesterol called, called cholesterol sulfate and there's evidence that it goes up during a heart attack that the mechanism suggests that raising cholesterol sulfate could help prevent heart disease and that's increased by sitting in the sun a little bit amyloid plaques that's not something that uh, you wouldn't think could possibly have a reason for existing but amyloid plaques cause uh, are caused by blood sugars going up it causes cascades that blunt too much glucose to go to the brain and the brain the brain in response to this blunting it because it's too much, uh, goes into a low hypo, low um, blood sugar, and that leads to amyloid plaques following up to try to fix it. And the amyloid plaques, uh, we, you know, we have a sense of what they do, but um, they 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 initially come to clean it up, and then they accumulate. And it's not the cause; it's the symptom. That's Amy Berger. Uh, the an- Alzheimer's anecdote. Um, uh, Stephanie Seneff was the cholesterol self- sulfate. I think I said that. Uh, cancer, you know, I don't understand w- what it is about cancer. Why anybody, why anybody isn't asking the question? What? Uh, it, well, I'm, I'm, I am not recommending this, but I've known some cancer patients who have decided to live with cancer, and sometimes they do. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't shorten their lives, but but why isn't anyone asking the question of why can't why why is cancer there and what is it trying to do and if it's trying to do something? Um, cancer is a symptom of um, undifferentiated cells. Uh, it's failed. It's undifferentiated cells C- cells differentiate in the liver and you know you have various organs. They're but when they become a cancer cell, they lose their differentiation. So when you look at, under a microscope, you don't know whether you're looking at a cancer cell or something else. It's just a cell, cancer cell. <laughs> but why aren't they asking that question? Why? I guess because it doesn't make money and it breaks all the conventions. Um, we're going to need to take a brief musical break. When we come back, um, maybe we can get... Jeffrey to talk about some stuff along with it, along with me, and um, yeah, let's let's listen to some music for a minute first. This is your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. This is our last show, and this break music I'm going to use uh, is called the Lark Ascending. Bon Williams wrote it. He um, he wrote it to memorialize the fallen soldiers in World War One. When you listen to the end, as the lark is ascending into the clouds, let your heart open.
Welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you're listening to the last year on health and fitness. But you can uh, continue to visit our website at yourownhealthandfitness.org for our almost 700 other shows, free access to recordings as downloads, all of them. Um, you can stay in touch with us also at uh, admin at yourownhealthandfitness.org. But remember that we can't answer individual health questions uh, or give referrals or any of that sort of stuff. We we really don't have any referrals and things like that. But you can just stay in touch uh, with us if you want to. It might be worthwhile sort of talking about a little bit, um, I, not that I haven't talked about it enough over the years, but uh, examples of how to, how, to, how to work with difficult symptoms. Examples are that you start with the symptoms and you trace them back to, trace them back to changes in, in your environment and changes in your, um, what you're taking. And if you've noticed that, uh, you've had a change from changing a supplement or uh, an herb or, or anything or, or if your environment in fact has changed, notice that too. Notice what Patterns uh, uh, sort of arise, blood pressure, pulse are very important for flagging. If your pulse is really high, but your blood pressure is low, it might mean that you're getting very hyper aroused by something. Um, the other side of it is blood pressure is high and pulse is high. That's not very good. That's very, <laughs> as it means you're getting very hyper aroused or blood pressure low and pulse. Oh, it just goes on and on and on. So your pulse and your blood pressure are good are good things to check, and you can check them yourself. Always rest first if you have a symptom that you can't identify and you you don't know whether to be scared or not. <laughs> but you can always rest first and see if that it has if that has an effect. Uh, if you end up with a diagnose diagnosis that is frightening research alternative views of etiology like vitamin deficiencies and exposures and, and the, the the things that may may be easier to 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 to, to sort of to deal with doing the simplest things first changing your vitamin exposure changing your nutrient density um i might mention also that there is a book that life is life extension i'm not at all an advocate of life extension necessarily because they represent uh, they're a good company but they represent a company that um, is at the forefront of vitamins as nutraceuticals it's, everybody's doing it now so it doesn't matter whether they do it or not the disadvantage to doing that is that they may have some fancy form of some vitamin that may be a very simple form will work very well but they produced a, a book. Oh gosh, I don't have it with me now. But it's a big book of all their vitamin and all the all the research that they have. It's quite an extensive uh, book with research in it, and it it's a good place to start because it talks about the etiology of these problems, and in a very 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 good way. And so it's a good thing to to look at when you're really conflicted and confused. I think if you look into uh if you look at vitamin uh, vitamin um lifeextension.com and go to their good books you'll be able to find it. It's a very big book and it's um it's a bit bit it's a bit pricey too, but it's a good a good a good um book to have at home. And another book that's like that that's much easier it's much smaller is uh, Dr. Sand, and she's written it with a couple of other doctors. Uh, it is um, smart medicine for a uh, healthier, healthier life. Yeah. Uh, are you likely uh, to die of this sooner um, without invasive treatments? You know, you get a it, it really scary diagnosis. Are you likely to die of this, or, or are the invasive treatments that often used for this hasten death find others with the, the diagnosis and learn what they've been doing as well and be a medical minimalist tell doctors that you're a medical minimalist don't take all of what they say as being 
you know, this is this ecclesiastic sort of quality. This is the only way to do it. This is the if you if you do enough research, you should find people who have a diagnosis like it. And and in some cases, they're really not treating it the way that the other people have treated it. So you're not going to find that in a doctor's office. In fact, you're not going to find anything in a doctor's office except for diagnostic and conventional treatment and um, very conventional treatment, very, very conventional treatment. And that, that doesn't ask the right questions, it really doesn't. So you have to think very critically. People are truly different uh, in, in terms of w- what supports their health and balance. No one knows all the answers to these these questions. Don't get cemented in beliefs and lifestyles and whatnot. Um, dietary needs change as your life goes on and as you've lived in and what you've been exposed to. It, it, dietary change, dietary changes are common in old, in older age. And as you get older, uh, your need for nutrient density increases. And you may find that maybe you've been able to do a paleolithic diet and it's been very very good for you and then maybe as you get older um, you find that you're too thin on that and you may have to introduce high quality hypoallergenic starches uh, nobody knows for sure it, you, you have to experiment with your own body to see what you need but don't be afraid to change if something has worked for a long time and suddenly doesn't the, the, uh, often the other is more difficult to change where somebody's been eating a vegetarian diet and then want to change in something but um don't take it everything can be work for somebody every everything works for somebody if it's done very thoughtfully and carefully no one needs highly processed fake foods with damaged fats no it's <laughs> fats that are processed are damaged everybody needs some supplement help this is my belief research is based on how the question is being asked and the conclusions are actually um, not really the same as what they research so it shows so that if you read the research, you may find that that it's very different than what um what uh, what they what they set up to to prove and they it's an exa- good example of it is the n t p phone study where they found very scary lots of very very conclusive effects and then their conclusions sort of um didn't didn't match <laughs> so read the research and um you know remember the whole idea of cascades and domino effects and interdependence and balance because nothing nothing happens in a vacuum even if institutions even if you like them are not there to help you they're there's something to navigate use them for diagnosis some treatment but sh- you should be in charge of your own, you know your own health, and in that in that sense, have have your doctor. If there's if there's a real problem with getting what you want from them, allow them to write, or you can write it, or they write it. Usually, they want to write it because of their liability issues. Have them give you a medical release from liability that indemnifies them from the liability. Um, sign a release, say that I will not sue you if if. I find that um, this is, you know, it, it, if, if you allow me to take control over my own, make my own decision about what treatment I want, I will not tell you if it doesn't go well. Uh, and medicine, for, to give them some credit, is there for, it's, it's not about cure, it's about treatments. And um, there's a big difference in that. And lastly, I want you to remember that something that... Um, Something that uh, somebody said to me once uh, is that if, well, it's a story about some very smart, uh, very highly evolved um, gurus, whatever, in the Buddhist, Rinpoche's and and, um, Rinpoche's and Roshis and whatnot at, at, at talking to each other about enlightenment they said how funny it is that americans want to be enlightened because um enlightenment is like having an eyelash in your eye you know or if enlightenment is is like a rock it's like the rock is in your shoe so it doesn't um it doesn't save you from the pain 
It just gives you a different relationship to it. My greatest, uh, my greatest problem with science is that it's not a discovery. It's, interv- it's intervention because we can. And hang the consequences. There, there always are. If science is discovery, it's always disproved. And this institu- institutional science hunkers down and becomes ecclesiastic, like I said. And examples of that are ma- <laughs> mandatory vaccines. If they work, why do you have to have to ma- be met? Ma- I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. If they, if they work, you don't need them to be mandatory because, uh, if, 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 if you're vaccinated, then you, and, it, and you're protected against people who don't vaccinate. Think about it. Genetics really confused about what we believe about genetics. A techno fix for climate change. You don't have to say any more. Techno fix for I don't think so. Um, designer babies, not so great. CRISPR, GMO, all that stuff. Please think about your actions and what they, what your buying habits are. How much are you flying? I just some people tell me how they have they're really very very climate conscious and then become a vegan and they've gotten a they only get a they got a brand new well, electric plug-in car but the plug-in car is 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 it's it's using mostly electricity from the grid which is not very clean and the car itself is made with all these new plastics and toxins and whatnot. Um, so you don't get out of this without having to participate unless, and it's not your fault. Um, it's, it's the way of this, uh, the way it is. That's the way it is. Um, I wonder if Dr. Dr. Fawcett has something to say about the way it is. You, Lena Berman, saved my life. Uh-huh. And uh, we have been told by many people that Lena Berman saved their life. Oh, I don't know. Okay. And I can, I can tell you how she saved mine. Um, I, uh, you know, as I've noted before, my training is in political economy. In fact, I was trained as a Marxist economist, which uh, I am looking out for how power uh, corrupts in all sorts of ways, but particularly in what we know or what we think we know and how we get directed in terrible ways. But I was a a true believer in medicine and science and uh, how all of that uh, was, I would would go to the doctor, in fact, kind of famously, my my brother once told me when I asked him how his blood sugars were doing, and he said, oh, I just go to the doctor, and he tells me whether things, and I do what the doctor tells me. And I wasn't quite that um, that blind, uh, because I wanted to inform myself as to what was going on, but I took as gospel what the medical profession said. I thought that the doctor's the doctor's office is where you got um, where you got health. Uh, at about 50 years old, uh, I did an annual physical, and the doctor said, uh, after doing all the routine tests, "Well, you know, by the time you're 60, you're going to have to be taking insulin." And that did not sit well for me because I could remember as a young as a young boy watching my grandparents uh, inject themselves with insulin and not liking that idea at all. At that time, I happened to be in a situation where I heard, I listened, to, was able to listen to KPFA quite a lot, and in particular, I would hear this, um, this uh, beautiful voice on, on the radio and uh, it, it was Lena Berman, and I thought after this doctor's visit, I wonder if she has anything to say. And I called and asked, made an appointment, and um, the rest is history. But what happened is as she educated, as Lena educated me about um, 
that different way, that unique way of thinking about health and where medicine fits in there. I had one of those, um, Paul on the way to Damascus getting knocked off his donkey, realizations of, wait a minute, all this time that I have spent studying how political con economies are corrupted by power about how the, how science and medicine is a, a, a pair, it's, it, it's a, a piece of that structure of power relationships. And that started me not just digging into how to improve my own health, which is, has become an ongoing and developing process with me, um, but how more generally uh, medical um, medical and health practices and health knowledge uh, are very much in, in under the same kind of influences as what goes on with foreign policy or climate change, um, which uh, just as a side thing, I, I recently saw a movie called Vice, which I highly recommend. It's about Vice President Dick Cheney. And the reason that comes up in this notion of climate change is it, it turns out, if if this film is correct, that the concept of or the, the words climate change got introduced in kind of the same way that Defense Department got in, introduced, that people who wanted to control the dialogue on global warming thought global warming, after seeing that people in focus groups reacted negatively to that idea made it into climate change, much more neutral. That stuff is in that, that power relationship, that manipulation is present always. And I believe that the work that Lena has done on the air and to some extent what I have tried to do in my little bits and pieces um, on the air is to uh, help you listening uh, to us navigate the dangers of health information, medical information, and those institutions. Uh, and uh, I, I am, I am, uh, like I said, I am, I am forever grateful for having that introduced to me, that way of thinking. And uh, I realize how um, listening to the radio, uh, listening to anything that you will get sound bites and you will be looking for specific things having to do with you. But in my view, the most important thing that Lena's work has done on the air has been to introduce you to, to suggest to you a way of thinking about your health which is independent of hierarchical institutions that in many respects are antithetical to your health. And that's in some that show that I did last week on Medicare for all not being enough uh, was, was about that. Um, but we, we need to say that you, been listening to your own health and fitness the last episode, and that's all she wrote. And what? Well, I just want to make sure this is a segue and kind of out of context, but one of the things to note that we actually we have been asked uh, about is as far as uh, that, as, at least as long as we're uh, going, that the archive of shows that we have on a, our site, that website's going to stay alive for the indefinite future. And I encourage you to to uh, take advantage of that and, and listen to those shows and grasp uh, not just specific pieces of information, not just sound bites, 
not just solutions to the specific problem that you are looking for, uh, but, uh, and I had an instance today, someone was looking for, is, is threatening to have their house tented for oh. termites. Um, so I sent them links to three shows done by Art Slater on alternatives to that. And that information is there. And that's quite important. But the important part of that is there's another way of thinking about these problems, of approaching them. And that, to me, is the core of what has been a value, both to me personally and I believe to you listening of the work that Lena has done. Oh, how can I say goodbye to you? I knew this was going to choke me up. Be kind, be kind to... Oh, (laughs) jeez. Be kind to each other. And remember that if I've taught you anything, it's it's to really honor yourself, to really honor your pain and your pleasure and your joy and um, each other and the creatures and the woods and all of it. But um, most of all, to not let anyone boss you around or take advantage of you or to, to be strong, to be, you can be, you can, you can push back without being cruel. And you can also really honor those of us who are in our society, who are different. That would be a real gift to me. If you could honor those and give a pause when you think that someone is crazy before you, before you make that decision about them, be be open-minded and take in the fact that everybody is different and, and responds differently and lest you should end up in the same boat. You know, um, Katie Singer wrote a book called The Electronic Silent Spring where she has testimonials from people who were not at all sensitive and who were exposed mightily as I was you know, working in the station for several years with antennas on the roof and um, it's, it's just been ramping up. I wasn't really this sensitive until uh, until the smart meters came out and the smartphones came out because they're all computers and then that pushed it over the edge. I can't even go into the city anymore, my lovely city, and, and look, go to the museums and look at paintings. I can't do that anymore. I can't even go to parks anymore because parks have infrastructure for wireless technology and emergency services so if you want to honor me you can honor the disability you can honor other people who are disabled in this way and um, make your voice be heard make your voice be heard that's it. Um, that's that's what we have to say to you. I'm sure I'll think of lots of things to say after it's over, but that's the way it goes. You'll have to say them. You have to say that them to doctors. You'll have to say them to sick people. You have to be gentle to all the people out there and and rough on the hard people who are not gentle, who are <laughs> not making it better, who are making it worse. So with all my heart. To this lonely kid who never dreamed that she'd have an audience this large. I I did it with love and I really will miss you. I'll miss you very much. Bye bye for now. Bye bye.
Hey everyone, this is Mitch Chesrich. I hope you could join myself along with Kat Brooks of Upfront as we will be hosting KPFA's live coverage of Attorney General William Barr's testimony to the House Judiciary Committee this Thursday, May 2nd, starting at 6 a.m. We will be bringing you Democracy Now! at 5 a.m. So, Thursday, May 2nd, 5 a.m., Democracy Now! followed by KPFA's live coverage of William Barr's testimony to the House Judiciary Committee. Anne Lamott is the much-loved author of Traveling Mercies, Bird by Bird, and other tender, humorous delights. She'll read from her new book, Almost Everything, and then converse with Reverend John Deere about peace and nonviolence. Monday evening, May 20th, at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Co-sponsored by KPFA, this is a benefit for Pache Ibene's campaign for nonviolence. For tickets or more information, please go to 